Holy Spirit descended with power on the little group of disciples. This was the realization of Jesus' promise of the Comforter who was to come. And so he left us so the Holy Spirit is also the Comforter. He's the teacher. He's the revealer. The Pentecostal outpouring of the Holy Spirit was truly a phenomenal event. There were several phenomena associated with it. And there was first the sound of a mighty mush rushing wind. There, was a, there were the tongues of fire upon the heads of those present. And they all spoke with tongues and prophesied. When the Holy Spirit is allowed free reign in the church, joy and excitement are inevitably present. Mm -hmm. But this is not a runaway display of uncontrolled emotion. There are no activities that will embarrass anyone, nor is it ever displeasing to God. There is a definite difference between joy and excitement of the Spirit anointing and plain old noise and confusion. Amen. I put that in there because, oh my, there was a time that I got just a little bit, I didn't know if I wanted to go to Pentecostal churches. Because, man, I seen some stuff. Yeah. You know? And people, you, you know, and, and it, it's something, there's still a problem I have. Or you're dancing in the flesh or you're dancing in the spirit. Well, it's just flesh dancing. So how do you dance in the Spirit? Now, I understand what they're trying to say. The Holy Spirit will move upon you, but it's still flesh. It's emotion. And so sometimes we even get real funny there. Well, they in the Spirit or they in... Well, the flesh is... If I'm dancing, it's my flesh dancing, so I guess I'm dancing in my flesh, you know. And... But there is order, though. Now what we've seen, and what I have had happen, and I've seen it happen, is you're in the middle of preaching right now, and the next thing you know, Ruth jumps up and has a word for her, and starts prophesying in the middle of me preaching. That's out of order. Right. Now remember how I said that the Holy Spirit, everything's in order, and they're all in unity, the Father, the Son. So there's order and there's unity. We see it in the creation. We see it that it's a cosmos, it's not a, it's not a, uh, a chaos. But everything works and revolves and everything, there's an order to it. And God has an order in the service. Now what I've seen happen is when there's supposed to be a word given, all of a sudden they'll get kind of quiet. And you just know that, oh, it's time for something. But you can't have, and I remember, <laughs> went to Catherine Kuhlman meeting someone stood up and started that in the middle of her preaching. And she pointed right back there and she says, ushers, get them out. They're out of order. And the ushers went and the guy stood up and tried to cross them. There's order, you know. Mm -hmm. And you're not going to do it. But yeah, people will dance. I, I was just in a meeting the other day and, and, and someone ran around the church. You know, the Lord, I guess, moved upon them. But you know, we never get to the place that we're out of control. The Bible says that the, how does it say it? It says that the, the spirit is, in other words, the prophet controls the spirit. In other words, if you're not out of control, and I can't word it this right. How does that word it? Anybody have to help me out? But in other words, that you're in control. Because I remember sitting one time in a meeting and somebody's saying, oh, there's this time I just had to bust out in tongues and I just can't control it. And I looked at him and I said, that's not scriptural. Because yeah. it says the Spirit is, how does it say, the Spirit is subject to the prophet or however it words. Oh, I'll find it where I'm trying to shoot from my hip. I know the word says it. And he got mad at me. And people would know who it is if I said. But one of the, my dad wasn't there. Bob Ladd was there. Bob wasn't in. Bob wasn't right there right then. He was there, but not at that. He wasn't in on that conversation. But Mr. Swartz was. Who was his name? Walter. Walter Swartz was there. And I knew Walter knew the word. And Walter was sitting in. And so they, they said, Walter, is Mark right? And they thought that I was wrong. And he looked at me and says, yeah, you're right. What are you saying? You're subject. You, you. So... Even if you're dancing and stuff, it's not like you can't control it. Right. You're, you're yielding to that, and that's fine. And whatever, though. 
But then we've seen some things. I've seen people acting like horses and all kinds of stuff. And I'm looking at that. And people getting all out of order. There's, there's no confusion. I'm going to say this, and it's the truth. So the most important thing that's going to take place in this service is the preaching of the Word. Yes. The songs are good, and all that's good. It prepares you for the Word, but the most important thing is the preaching of the Word. And what I've seen happen, and boy, it sounds Christian, doesn't it? It sounds God, it sounds religious, it sounds good. I've seen services where they start cutting back on the preaching and they did more singing. And this one had to sing and that one had to sing. We've got to sing more songs. Now, sometimes that's okay. I've seen services where that's okay. But I've also seen services. I've sit there and said to the Lord, I said, now, Lord, if you gave me a message and I know you gave me a message, then Vernon should be singing 10 songs. Because I got a message. I know you gave me a message. So that means I'm supposed to preach that tonight. But if the songs go on forever, I can't preach. And so there's a problem. And I've seen that happen. I've seen people get up and start. And, and now, lately in the services I've been in, it's been real good. But I remember Dad, you know, and it happened more then than it has now. But he'd give up and give a testimony. And an hour later, the person finally sits down. Well, you're not going to give an hour testimony. You give a five-minute testimony. And they have to start saying, you know, this will be limited, you know. And so there has to be order. Huh? Oh, my God. Son. And I know, and I could, be, I could be guilty of it because I can get up and talk a lot. And I can see me getting up and saying too much and, you know, getting out of order. So I'm not getting on anybody. But it's just things that we have to be aware of that you do have to be receptive. That's why there's one person in charge normally, and that would be the pastor. And he can stop things and he can start things. This is what I've heard. This is where I've asked the Lord to help me. I've heard that Jimmy Swigert, even years ago even, he could go into a service and sometimes things would begin to get dry. It would begin, and even the pastor that was there didn't know what to do at times. And the God had given Swigert a, a gift or he would just be, that he would know and he would start, and, and he would get up and say, okay, we're going to sing this song. And he could bring people right back into the presence of yes. God. And he would know how to be receptive. You know, you shouldn't just get up and just preach or just sing a song because that's on your list. You should be seeking God. To, what songs are for this week? See, I can't, I'm not supposed to just get up and preach anything. I have messages at times, but they're not for now. Because I asked the Lord, I said, I want to be in due time and in due season with the preaching. Well, the music is supposed to be in due time and due season too. Right. Yes. And maybe that particular song isn't for today. Because there's something happening and it's a different song. Maybe the praise and worship will take more of a praise that service than a worship. You understand what I mean between yes. praise and worship? Mm -hmm. And then, then another time it may go into more worship because that's the lead. And so the, 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 the praise and worship leader has to be receptive to what God wants. And so it takes time. And so as I start praying on Monday, I'll start praying tomorrow. And I'll say, Lord, what do you want for Sunday? And I start praying. Sometimes I don't get things right away. Sometimes I, I love the weeks where I get something early on. And the same thing, if you're being used in a ministry of song or whatever, you should be praying throughout, what is it? And you should come. So we don't come. They had, did you see what it said? They had this expectation that something was going to happen. Amen. And they were in one accord waiting on it. Do we come to church with that expectation of something happening? Well, we're only a few people. I, I, I'm telling you what I, what I battle with. Well, it's only a few. It has to be a hundred here to have a move of God. No, no, no it doesn't. And there's times that, I've, that and I've, I've talked to different ones now that, they say, man, we like a smaller church because you, you just you're more like a family and it's more personable on you, yes. and you can do. And and then there's advantages both ways, you know. But whatever your job is, you should be prayed up and ready for that. You know, they wanted Jeanette to sing. She said she wasn't ready. And then she said later, she said the Lord kind of showed you need to be instant in season out season. So she got up and, and did it anyway. And and Pastor Watson, you know, commended her for that. Yes. 
He said, yeah, you have, did you have that gift, so you've got to be ready. And we got to be ready to preach and be ready to do what, you know, whatever it is the Lord wants you to do. Where was I? When the joy of the Lord is present, people do not sit idly by with frozen expressions in the silence of a morgue. <laughs> there is instead the lifting of hands, as Paul described in Timothy. Additionally, there are always, almost always expressions of joy and exclamation, such as hallelujah and praise the Lord when the glory of God fills the place. People can't restrain themselves from joining in the worship of the Lord. This is where I have a problem when you got people that tell me they're born again and spirit filled, yet you're in and you got music and you got good preaching and they're sitting there dead. There's something wrong. Now my dad got on me in the past. And what was wrong, I remember what was wrong at that time is I'd kind of gotten away from the Lord and I just didn't. But if you're, I'll say it this way, if you're drinking wine at home, the new wine, in your prayer closet, then you're going to bring some wine to church and we're all going to drink. Yes. See? And we all need to come together. You're all important. You know, you all have a job. And it's not just a one-man show. See, I, I see people and I work with heathens. And, man, they all get excited to talk about money. I mean, you know. Man, we they did this thing over at work when that Powerball or whatever it was was up real high, you know, and they were going to buy tickets. And everybody was excited. There was just excitement. And they were saying, man, if I win this, this is what I'll do. And if I win it, that's what I'll do. And different ones were saying this. And, they, you know, there, there was like excitement, you know. And I thought, well, we should be much more excited about this power that we're talking about. Yeah. Yeah. And the things of God. And just the fact that, and I, I get there too, all that, or God, you know, mad because Daddy died and all this, you know. But yeah, I should still be thankful that I'm on my way to heaven. Yeah, Daddy Diane wasn't what I wanted. But then the Bible goes on to say it says, well, it's not about me. It's about his will. Yes. Must have been God's will. I don't understand it. And it's okay to go to God with that type of a question. Not, you can say, I know why. And if God chooses to tell you. And it's not the way I would have done it. But we should just have that excitement that we're born again and we're on our way to heaven. Some people are reluctant to allow the Holy Spirit to move in a congregation. Some, some view the book of Acts negatively and dislike any emphasis placed on the mighty moving of the Holy Spirit, especially the manifestation of the gifts of the Spirit. And so we should have the gifts of the Spirit in operation. Yes. We should be lifting our hands and worshiping the Lord. You know, this is something we talked about the Lutheran Church and being there, and there you did. You sit there and you were very solemn and everything. And when those got saved, they couldn't be there no more. Because right. they said, we want to raise our hands. We want to feel free. We know we're not free to do that. It's frowned upon. And the pastor looks at you funny and people look at you. And we want to go to a church where we can raise our hands and we can shout hallelujah and we can shout praise the Lord and we can dance if we want to and so forth. Now we see that it's kind of dying and people just come and they just want to sit, you know. But like Mother told me, and it's true, if they don't have the rivers of water within them, they're not going to pour out. And I don't care how hard I try to unloose that dam, it's not going to pour out. Amen. you got to have that within you. Jerusalem at Pentecost, this is what it was. Now when this was noise abroad, the multitude came together and they were confounded because every man heard them speak in his own language. And they were all amazed and marveled, saying one to another, Behold, are not all these which speak Galileans? Are not all those Americans? And yet I'm hearing Japanese, and I'm hearing Chinese, and I'm hearing German, and I'm hearing all these other languages is what they were saying. And how were we ever been in our own tongue wherein we were born? Uh, Parthenians and Medes and, Medi Medi and Alamites and dwellers in Mesopotamia and Judea and, and Cappadocia and Pontius and Asia, Hyria and Pamphylia and, and Egypt and in all parts of Libya about Cyrene and strangers of Rome, Jews and apostolites, Cretes and Arabians. We all hear them speak in our own tongues the wonderful works of God. So what were they speaking? They were speaking about God. They were praising God. They were speaking of the wonderful works of God. And they were all amazed and were in doubt, saying one to another, what does this mean? 
And others mocked, said, well, they are drunk. There were devout men from every nation dwelling in Jerusalem, which was the commercial center of the Middle East. Some were simply on business, while others were present for the religious festival or feast day. As the disciples erupted out onto the street, word spread rapidly, and a crowd gathered, because it is both, well, I, I didn't go on with that. But the language is both a language that can be understood somewhere in the world and an expression of the individual's inner being or spirit. And sometimes you'll have groanings. The Bible talks about that. I've seen people just kind of groan, and those are the, that's what proceeds forth as a, the spirit. And I don't understand it all. We don't understand it all. We just know that it's a spiritual thing, and the spirit, uh, the Holy Spirit's moving through you to, be, to pray and to make these expressions. This speaking in tongues or, or different languages is not normally for the purpose of evangelizing the lost. It is generally an expression of praise. There are, however, numerous accounts of individuals speaking in an unknown tongue while someone is present who understands the language. Some of these instances have involved languages used in remote areas where, which were recognized and understood by a missionary who had worked in these areas. Invariably, the message is an expression of the praise of the Lord. So what it's saying is, most of the time, tongues is just a, a, an expression of praise. It's, a, it, it's to be used for praise. But there's, like they're saying, there have been times that the Lord has moved upon someone and has spoken tongues in the, in the language that they need to speak to those people that are there. Many were added to the church. I'm not going to go through all this, but, but uh, uh, this is where Peter comes out and starts preaching. With the curious crowd of skeptics gathered around the disciples, Peter seized the opportunity to start preaching to them. And you can read about it in Acts chapter 2, verses 14 through 41. He preached in his own language, which would have been Hebrew or Aramaic. He was not therefore speaking in tongues at that moment, but he was speaking under the anointing of the Holy Spirit. And so you can have that anointing of the Holy Spirit to preach. And to bring forth, and you have that anointing of the Holy Spirit for what songs to sing and what scriptures to sing. They're the same. You should sing them if you want. Peter declared to them the promise of God and the salvation of the Lord. He also told how Joel prophesied in this very outpouring of the Spirit of God. And again, you can read that back in Acts. And so he preached to them, and he preached with a different anointing, with, a, with power now, because he had received that baptism in the Holy Spirit. He went, and then went on to inform them of some events which would take place just prior to the Great Tribulation, which would immediately precede the millennium. His primary emphasis concerned the redemptive work of Jesus Christ, whom they had rejected. And so he preached under that power of the Holy Spirit, and they said there were many added to the church. Peter preached Christ to them on the anointing and power of the Holy Spirit, and 3,000 souls were added to the church that day. The book of Acts of the Apostles might also be called the Acts of the Holy Spirit. It recounts the early moving of the Holy Spirit in the lives of the individuals and churches. So we talk about, here we'll, we'll see an account with Peter and John. Now Peter and John went up together to the temple at the hour of prayer being the ninth hour. And a certain man lame from his mother's womb was carried, whom they had daily, who they laid daily at the gate of the temple, which is called Beautiful, to ask alms of those that entered into the temple. Who seeing Peter and John about to go into the temple, he asked for alms. And Peter fastened his eyes upon him with John, said, Look on us. And he gave heed unto them, expecting to receive something of them. Then Peter said, Silver and gold have I none, but such as I have, give I thee. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And he took him by the right hand and lifted him up, and immediately his feet and ankles, bones received strength. See, he had the, the power of the Holy Spirit to, to speak to this man. And he leaping up, stood and walked, and entered with them in the temple, walking and leaping and praising God. And all the people saw him walking and praising God. And they knew that it was he which sat at the alms at the beautiful gate of the temple, and they were filled with wonder and amazement at that which had happened unto them. We see Ananias and Sapphira, they meet with the Holy Spirit. Yeah, they do. <laughs> and I won't read the whole thing, but they held back. <laughs> and Ananias, hearing these words, fell down and gave up the ghost, and great fear came upon them. And so he had held back some, and he lied yeah. to the Holy Spirit. And we see 
his account, and I won't read the whole thing, but they both end up dying. Obeying God. And by the hands of the apostles were many signs and wonders wrought among the people, and they were all with one accord in Solomon's porch. And of the rest there still man joined himself to them, but the people magnified them, and, that, and believers were the more added to the Lord, mocked to both of men and women, inasmuch as they brought forth the sick into the streets, and laid them on beds and couches, that at the least the shadow of Peter passing might overshadow some of them. There came also a multitude out of the cities round about unto Jerusalem, bringing sick folks and men which were vexed with unclean spirits, and they were healed, every one. So we see that demons were cast out, and people were healed, even those that came under the shadow of Peter's, or Peter's shadow were healed. Not only was sin dealt with swiftly, and we've seen that with Ananias and Sapphira, and intently in the New Testament church, but in another area, Scripture declares that by the hands of the prophets were many signs and wonders brought among the people. The sick were healed in great numbers, some being brought in their beds to be placed where Peter's shadow would fall upon them. Peter and the apostles, they were placed in prison. Then the high priest rose up, and all they were with him which is the second of the Sadducees, and were filled with indignation. <laughs> you know, it's kind of interesting, but it's the religious leaders that get upset, isn't it? Yeah, and laid their hands on the apostles and put them in the common prison. They were put in prison for preaching and yeah. preaching the gospel. But the angel of the Lord by night opened the prison doors and brought them forth and said, Go and stand and speak in the temple to the people all the words of this life. And when they heard that, they entered into the temple early in the morning and taught. The high priest came, and they were... They were with him and called the council together and all the sin of the ch children of Israel and sent to the prison to have them brought. And so we see that they were released from the prison, that the Holy Spirit worked a miracle that day. So we see the miracles and the signs and the wonders that were happening right. after this day of Pentecost. We see Stephen. And Stephen was full of, holy, full of faith and power, did wonders and miracles among the people. And we see that, uh, and I'll ask that, and there was certain of the set of the synagogue which called the, the synagogue of the Libertines, the Cyrenes, and the Alexandrians of them of, the, of Sicily and Asia, disputing with Stephen. And they were not able to resist the wisdom and the spirit by which he spoke. So these people were disputing with Stephen. But he had a wisdom which he received from the Holy Spirit. Then they said, some armed men which said, We have heard him speak blasphemous words against Moses and against God. And they stood up the people and the elders and the scribes and came upon him and caught him and brought him to the council. And set up false witness which said, This man ceases not to speak blasphemous words against the holy place and the law. We have heard him say that this Jesus of Nazareth shall destroy this place and shall change the customs which Moses delivered unto us. And all that set that council looked steadfastly on him. Saw his face as it had been the face of an angel, so he had the glory of God on him. He wasn't scared to get up and preach. But the religious folk who, 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 who rejected the Holy Spirit, they were blinded and they couldn't see that those were all types and symbols of Christ. He was preaching, he was preaching what Moses gave him. But they were just religious. And we see religious people today. But they denied the power. <laughs> yeah, I know. In this day and age, we, we, we have to be careful how we speak. We have to be careful how we preach to people. We don't want to offend anybody. Well, they're seekers. And they're here seeking. <laughs> Stephen called them stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears. You always resist the Holy Ghost as your fathers did so. Do you, which of the prophets of that your fathers persecuted. Man, he told them, didn't he? Mm -hmm. There's some preaching. Yeah. Uh. And he got up under the power of the Holy Spirit, but they stoned him. Yeah. And he kneeled down and cried with a loud voice, Lord, lay not to sin to the charge. And when he had said this, he fell asleep, he died. But some say that Paul was there. Mm -hmm. And when they heard these sayings, they were cut apart and they knifed on him with their teeth. Boy. I don't know what the I, what these seeker sensitive preachers do with us. Because now you're supposed to sell very positive words to everybody. So let them come as they are. 
And yet we see Stephen. He called him stiff neck and uncircumcised. And it came to pass that while Apollos was at Corinth, Paul, having passed through the upper coast, came to Ephesus and found certain disciples. And he said to them, and the praise and worship team can go ahead and prepare to go up. And he said to them, have you received the Holy Spirit or the Holy Ghost that you believe? And they said to him, we have not so much as heard whether there be any Holy Ghost. And he said to them, under what then were you baptized? And under John's baptism. So John preached repentance, right? So these people were saved. But evidently there is a separate work here, isn't there? They didn't receive it when they were saved. Now we know what John the Baptist preached. He said, repent. And he said, you got to bring John the Baptist. I'm not baptizing you unless you show fruits of repentance. So they must have been saved. Because they had not received the Holy Ghost. Then said Paul, John very baptized with the baptism of repentance, saying unto the people that you should believe on him which should come forth after him, that is, on Christ Jesus. When they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And when Paul had laid his hands upon them, the Holy Ghost came on them, and they spake with tongues and prophesied. And so they were saved, but they received the baptism in the Holy Spirit. And, they, and, the, and the evidence of receiving that baptism of the Holy Spirit was that they, prophes or they, they they spoke with other tongues and they prophesied. We need to continually be filled. And so, if anybody would like to come up as they're playing up here. If anybody would like me to pray with you and I'll help. Thank you. 